Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Donna Marenti. I hope I pronounced that right because I didn't ask her how to pronounce it. Yeah, thank you. And she is with New Dawn Dementia Understandings. She's a nurse, a certified dementia practitioner, and a whole bunch of other letters after her name, as she said. So thanks so much for joining me, Donna. My pleasure. So we're going to talk today about how to stay connected when we can't be together physically, which is a great topic right now, but it's a good topic even past pandemic, let's hope. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I know so, from people that have reached out to me, it seems like a lot of their loved ones are declining faster because of their routines being upended and lack of stimulation from different people, which... I think has been a surprise. So I don't know if you have any any suggestions or thoughts for them, but we can talk and then maybe something will pop into your head. Okay. All righty. So what kind of ideas do you have for helping people stay connected when we're physically distant? Well, I mean, first of all, um, the amount of routine that's either been kept in place or has gone by the wayside Um, depends a lot on the environment that they're in. Um, I know in home environments, you might think it's easier to keep people in their regular environment, in their regular routine, but not so much because we're all uh, kind of swimming in uncharted waters right now. I know um, pretty much across the board, most of the care communities are following um, state health department guidelines and so they are closed to visitors right now. Um, It's difficult, but what we need to keep in mind is, of course, everybody is at their own, on their own journey with dementia, um, because some two people might both be in the first or second stage of dementia doesn't mean that they have the same functionality and the same capabilities. It, It, Nobody has the same two fingerprints, so nobody experiences um, dementia in in the same way. So stop and think where your loved one is on their journey. Um, if they're just beginning, if it's a, a it is a very early stage and or even a later stage, but there are parts of their cognition that um, they've managed to hang on to. Factor, you need to factor in where they are on their personal journey. So having said that, um, I know that um, a lot of people have been doing the the window visits, going up to the window and and doing visits like that. Um, Another way that we can stay in touch is to remember, you know, that there's five senses and physical touch Tactile touch is one of the five, so that leaves us 80% of our senses to play with. Um, So one of the things that um, is a a real good way to be in touch and also provide comfort, um, I can suggest maybe having a photo pillow or a photo blanket made for them. Um, there's the, there is the tactile element there. If you get a nice, soft, fluffy fabric, it can be very comforting. Um, something to hug, something, you know, just to wrap themselves up in. But the one thing that we need to keep in mind if we're doing any sort of a photo project, whether it's um, an album or um, a pillow, a blanket, is that because part of what dementia does is rob people <clears throat> of complete portions of their blocks of memory, their episode memory, episodic memory. What's happening is, say, let's say, for example, we all have a file for every year that we've lived. And dementia goes in there, and it starts with the most recent file. And it pulls out 2020, pulls out 2019, shreds that file, and goes, just keeps going back and back and back until the file drawer starts maybe at 1962 or 1958, 43, however far back, you know, however many of the recent 
blocks of memory um, the dementia has decimated. So that when your loved one opens that file drawer, first file they come to might be 1953. And that's their timeline, and that's their reality. And it's not because they're so confused that they don't know that it's, you know, 40 or 50 years later. It's because they have no tangible um, reference point because that has all been taken away from them. So if you're going to do a photo project, go back through the old photos because the alternative is maybe your mom um, looks at you and maybe you're 50, 60 years old and you go to visit and you say, hi, mom, and she says, who are you? That's not because she doesn't remember her daughter. It's because she can't place what you look like physically on her timeline because on her timeline, daughter is 10 years old. So you might be a very kind stranger that's going to visit her. In that respect, when, when we do all get back to the visits, if your parent or your loved one has a problem assigning your name and your face to who you say you are, then rather than go in and say, hi, mom, I'm your daughter, just go in and say, hi, I'm, I'm Donna. Hi, I'm Lizzie. I, I just came to say hi and sit with you for a while. I could use some company. Would you like to keep me company kind of a thing? So back to our project. So what we don't want to do is gather up a whole bunch of pictures of people from last month, no matter how tempting it is to say, oh, let's make pictures of her great granddaughter's wedding and we'll make this beautiful photo album and she's going to look at it and say, who are these people? So my suggestion for comfort and to enter there, to be on their timeline along with their journey and their reality, go back. Everybody's got some old pictures. Um, go back to whatever era in time they're living in. If it's 1953, then you know what? It's 1953. Go back and find, maybe find her wedding album or, you know, his pictures from when he was in the service. And it's easy enough, you know, the project doesn't have to be perfect. You can take a picture of the picture with your cell phone if you want to upload it to like a Walgreens or um, collage.com is one that also does photo blankets and things like that. So you don't need to find the negative. Just take a picture of it the best you can with your cell phone. Um, and when you, therefore, when you make that blanket or when you make that pillow, you're giving them something tangible. Ah, this is my family. This is my life. And they can hold on to that and they can kind of hug on that. And the other thing is that our sense of smell is very, very nostalgic. It, it evokes our sensory memory, which plays, which kind of connects to our limbic memory, which is very deep-rooted about the last portion to go because it's feelings. So maybe before you pack up that pillow, um, if your mom liked to bake, maybe give it a little spritz with some uh, vanilla extract. Um, some of the cologne your mom wore that was your dad's favorite, if you're making up something for your dad or your dad's aftershave, evoke that sensory comfort. Give that comfort through those senses, sense of smell. Um, you know, one gentleman uh, was a woodworker, loved to putter around in, in his little wood shop, and so I suggested, you know, before you send the blanket for a few days, Keep it in your house and go to a, a closet store. You can order them online and just ro roll it up in some cedar chips for a while. Shake it out real good because, you know, we don't want splinters. But um, when that person opened that blanket, it wasn't just the tactile sense of the blanket or the visual memory of back in the day but the smell that it evoked of the woodwork and the wood room, and it's very, oh, okay, I'm home. Because most of the time when people with dementia say, I want to go home, they're not talking about a brick and mortar, you know, this was my address on the corner of such and such. It's that whole concept of home when everything, you know, 
my life. I want to go back to that life. So you're able to evoke, um, you know, keep in touch through sense of smell, um, through their uh, tactiles, even though we can't touch them, the tactile sense, the visual sense, um, and taste, too. We've got that sense of taste, you know, especially if your loved one is at home with you. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's fine. It's very plausible if they're in a community as well. Find that recipe from years ago that maybe you made together and bake it up and give them a little taste of it. Oh, okay. They may not know what it is they're remembering, God bless them, but that it will evoke those feelings of well-being. And so in that sense, we can give reassurance. Um, and, if you and have laugh time. Sorry. One more suggestion. Okay. One of the things you can also do um, that I highly recommend is you can get a recordable storybook. They're available through any booksellers um, online. And they're the kind of books that, you know, they have pictures in a story and you record the story with your voice so that, you know, your grandchild or younger child can open the book and read it and blah, blah, blah. So what you do with that book is you take those pictures, again, from their timeline, maybe it's their wedding day, um, whatever, you know, your christening, whatever you want to do, as long as it's on their timeline and they can relate to it. Paste over the pictures in the book with your own pictures. Paste over the words in the book. People with dementia can read. It's part of our reflex memory, and somewhere along the line, we all decided they couldn't read, and nobody asked them. Um, nice big block letters, no curlicues, so you can type up your own text, keep it simple, paste it to go along with the pictures, and record that text with the book. And so there again, they're hearing your voice, you're giving them a piece of their life, their universe, and... Keep them busy turning those pages as well. I really like that suggestion. And I've been doing this a while and I've never heard that one. And then I laugh mm -hmm. because you said the scent, you know, evokes a feeling of, you know, a mental and physical feeling of comfort. And after my mom broke her leg and she was bed bound, I swear every time they, there was two weeks where I, before, well, during which I couldn't go see her, but every time I ended up in her community, they were baking chocolate chip cookies. I'm like, look, mm -hmm. you know, I can't, the gym is closed. I can't do half of my workouts like I was. So could you guys not like torment me with chocolate chip cookies? Because that's <laughs> what my mom did. My mom baked. When we can have a celebration of life, I'm doing a dessert bar and maybe some little mm -hmm. like tea sandwiches for people who need something besides sugar. <laughs> And I was just talking to my uncle this morning and he's got a, it's like, we have a, a, a hereditary sweet tooth on my mom's side of the family. So a dessert bar is really good. So I'm glad they were making chocolate chip cookies the last couple of weeks of her life because that had to be a really comforting feeling for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, at first when you said, you know, I was thinking back to when she was a kid with her two brothers and her sister, and they grew up on like a, a ranch. And I thought, oh, am I supposed to make it smell like dirt? <laughs> but cookies you would can. be better. <laughs> you, can. you know what? Whatever works for you, hay. Um, you know, you can, you can probably find a, uh, a mock scent of anything these days that's online. True. But, and, and yeah, I mean, that's a good point, too. You always want to make sure that it's a pleasant um, aroma. Because there are some smells, I mean, you know, that, that might just evoke a nightmare or something you never, I'll tell you what, when this whole COVID-19 thing is passed, if I ever again in my life smell lavender spray disinfectant, um, oh. I'm, uh, I'm not going to be too happy about that. So it's, it's all a question of, um, you know, what, what's pleasant for you. Um, and, you know, if, if on their timeline they look at your 10-year-old your daughter and think that's their daughter, then let the younger child record the book. Don't, don't push 
They, they don't need more confusion right now. Um, so whatever it was that they enjoyed doing, um, you know, bring it, bring it to them. People will meet you at the door in, in care communities. They will meet you at the door. Um, nobody's trying to be mean. We're just trying to, you know, everybody's trying to keep everybody safe. So, but I do know that um, most communities, if you maybe call from every, most people have a cell phone, just call and say, hey, I'm here, I'm out front. I'd, I'd like to drop these off for mom. Someone will come out and take your package and get it to your loved one. That, I think the care staff would appreciate seeing family members. As I know, two days before my mom passed away, the care staff called and said, mom's not doing really well. We think she'd benefit from a visit from you. And I said, mm -hmm. oh, thank God, because I'm trying to follow the rules. I'm, I'm being good, but it's been two weeks since I saw my mom, and I'm highly concerned that she will not remember me. Now, most people know. I don't think you do. My mom thought I was her longtime best friend. So, mm -hmm. and that was fine. I went with it. Um, I don't think she remembered a name. She couldn't attach a name to this face, but that's okay too. She, you know, she'd tell everybody that I was her best friend. She'd known me forever, which always made me laugh because it's like, yeah, technically you have. And I was very concerned that she would totally forget me and then not trust me. And we were already dealing with combativeness and fighting. It was not pretty. So when they called, I was very, very relieved. And I went the next morning. And, you know, they let me in and I got to, when I saw my mom, I was like, mm, this is not, this is not going to be like I thought it was going to be when she broke her leg. So I got to say all the good things that I needed to tell her. And then she passed away the next day and they called us. They called me and I called my sister and my uncle. And despite the fact that no, pe they did not want any guests, 10 of us ended up outside mom's room and the poor executive director. I don't think that guy gets paid enough money. He called me on my cell phone. I was like, well, I'll just talk to him on my way out. And so he came over because it was kind of like, can you people like go away? <laughs> like, yeah. But he never said any of that. It, it was very obvious to me what he meant. But yeah, no, the care, and when the care staff had called, they're like, we don't get to see anybody. We miss you guys. And so once this whole, you know, nightmare is over and I don't know, I'm in California. And I don't know, you know, care communities. I don't know where they're on on the reopening plan. I would think probably in the later phases, I'm going to go back. I still have to clean out my mom's room, which is kind of a bummer, but I'm going to go back and visit occasionally, bring my dog who was a huge hit with the ladies. And, mm -hmm. you know, just cause it's like, okay, wait a minute, you know, mom's gone and I can, I can deal with that, but it's like, there's all these other people that I've known for all these years. And, and we find that a lot in long-term care. And, and truly, it's, you know, people tend to think of, um, it, it's, been, it's been interesting because God bless all healthcare workers and, and you know, everybody who's doing as much as they can. Um, nursing homes, for some reason, you know, there are some not so good ones out there, but I think, you know, in the scope of everything, they are doing a, a wonderful job and trying hard. And, and they do miss that family um, family connection. So, yeah, I mean, by all means, um, take the pup and, and uh, maybe some of those famous cookies. Um, and, and, you know, in that way, too, your mom is, is remembered as well because I know – um, care staff get attached to people. It becomes like family. It, it's not your um, hospital 72 hours and they have to ship you out kind of thing. Everybody becomes part of everybody's life. So yeah, they, they probably really appreciate that. I think it would be sweet. And you know, if there were other um, residents there that maybe didn't get um, as many visits, um, it's always nice to just say hello. Again, they don't have to connect the dots that, oh, yes, I know, I knew your mom, and, and I know who you are. They don't have to know who you are. You're a pleasant, friendly face. Um, come to give some, some human connection. And, you know, that's a great thing to be able to give somebody. 
While we're on the topic of care residences, I have a question for you. I did a, an online seminar with Tipa Snow, and she does mm -hmm. not necessarily recommend the window visits because she says it might cause elopement syndrome, which for there's a fancy term and a nicer term that makes them want to leave. And so I tell people, you have to be really careful when you make decisions, if you're going to do a window visit, just keep that in mind that they may not understand why they can't go outside with you or you can't come in. So do you have an opinion on that? Or maybe... Well, I mean, I, I, certainly, um, I certainly don't disagree with that. It, it can prompt elopement. But, you know, the other side of that pendulum is that someone feeling that um, nobody is coming to them, so maybe they need to get to, to their loved one. You know, it's kind of a 50-50 balance there. And again, it, it all gets down to the individuality of where the person is at with dementia. Yeah, I don't disagree with her that, you know, it may prompt thoughts of, mm hmm, if I could get out there, but, you know, we need to um, assume, hopefully, that the, the care community has all that in place, that we shouldn't have to worry about pandemic visits to be on the same page, that it is a secure environment. So hopefully all those safeguards are in place anyway. And, you know, my opinion of that, my take on that is, while I don't disagree with it, I think that there's a 50-50 chance that somebody who hasn't seen a loved one in a long time might just feel like, I, I need to get out of here. I, I need to get back to the home, in quotes, um, to that feeling, to that person. So I, I'd go both ways with it. But again, it depends on the person. It truly and does. If it's going to upset them more, then yeah, don't do it. <laughs> Yeah, I never had that. My mom with me never had that. I need to get out of here. I need to go home. The first two months that she lived in the community were rough because she didn't think she belonged there. But after she was acclimated, it was like she completely forgot the home that she'd lived in for like literally two months shy of 47 years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it's like she developed her own reality. And she would say things like, well, I need to go back. If, if she was at my house for Thanksgiving or whatever, she, and she was getting tired. She made a comment once on Thanksgiving, and I for, had forgotten to warn my husband. She said, um, she, it was obvious she was confused, and she was looking around. And he's like, what you looking for, Mom? And she goes, I need to go back to my room, which fortunately I heard from the other room. And I immediately knew I need to take her back because she's tired. And he was trying to explain to her, well, no, you're at my house, blah, 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 all this talk, talk, talk. And fortunately, I heard it, so I just rushed in, and I said, oh, okay, I'll take you, and psh, out the door we went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I never had to deal with the, you know, her, her desire to leave, or, you know, I had to deal with the other residents that wanted to leave. Oh, my gosh, that was... <laughs> That was always fun because they're always asking me to take them places, take them home. <laughs> I was like, what do I well, look like the bus driver? There, <laughs> well, there again, you know, I um, step into their reality. And I, I think that when people are just beginning their journey with a loved one who has dementia, one of the biggest challenges that people face within themselves is feeling like they're lying to their loved one if, if they step into their reality. And it's not because to that person, it's real. It's not a lie. It's real. So you want to join them. So, you know, what I usually do is just um, distract. And I think probably a very overused phrase is redirect. Well, what do you mean redirect? You walk them from one side of the room to the other. That's not really redirecting. Um, so rather than say, no, you can't go out there. Um, you know, you can look at, okay, did this person raise children? So maybe say something like, oh, you know what, um, it's, you, yeah, your, your kids are going to arts and crafts after school. Um, they'll be fine for a while. Your sister's going to pick them up because a lot of the banging on the doors to get out at quarter to three in the afternoon is some of the people, some of the time, 
feel that, you know, they're back to where they needed to meet that kindergarten bus or that school bus, and they go into a panic about it because that's their reality. So rather than try and give a lengthy explanation that they're not going to believe you because they have no focal point for it, that their kids are 50 years old, they're going to say you're lying, they're not going to trust you. So as you're redirecting them maybe to a snack or, you know, whatever else, hey, let's go, let's go touch up your lipstick. It's almost time for, you know, for lunch or it's almost time for dinner. Let's go touch up your hair. While you're walking with them, you just say, oh, you know what? Yep, your kids are fine. They're fine right now. But, you know, tell me about them. Tell me about your daughter. Now, if she's telling you about her 50-year-old daughter's 7-year-old 4-H blue ribbons, go with it. That's great. She's sharing with you. So, there, you know, there's, there's ways around, around uh, having a complete meltdown and a, and a crisis. We don't need any more crises right now, do we? <laughs> no, I don't think we do. But um, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I know everybody that I know, and I do go into a lot of, uh, well, not now, go into, but you know, I'm in contact with a lot of uh, care facilities, nursing homes, and assisted living, um, memory cares. Their main concern is for the residents, and again, I don't deny that there's some bad apples out there, and it, it's a a shame that it's always the bad apples that make the headlines when there's so much good going on, you know, in care communities. The it's staff definitely there, not an easy job at all. No, it's not. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see them getting too many free lunches these days. I keep, and well deserved to all of the the um, hospital personnel, God bless them, they deserve everything that everybody is bestowing on them right now in a good sense. But, you know, it's, I always stop and think, oh, I haven't, haven't seen any parades past nursing homes, you know. <laughs> so we need to share the love a little bit, I think, because it, it is a different, um, a different environment for caregiving, but, you know, equally um, important in everyone's life. So that, that's just my two cents worth opinion. Um, well, I think you. I'm going to send an email to the executive director and the memory care director just to let them know that I'm thinking about them and I'm always saying nice things about them and I will be back someday, hopefully soon. So changing I gears. Yeah, it's like I'm always thinking about it, but I haven't told them. So thank you for prompting mm -hmm. that thought on me. So okay. how... How can we help people that are taking care of their loved ones at home whose schedules mm -hmm. have been completely upended? Like there's a couple of gals in my support group whose dad and husband attended the same social day program, which has been closed for two months now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've, I've checked in with one of them because we're friends, but it's just been a roller coaster ride for these gals taking care of their loved ones at home. I think it's actually worse than like where my mom was at. So when, again, different lives, different situations. So give me a little, um, little filler on that. Are these people whose loved ones maybe normally went to um, a day program a day center which is now closed yes. and so now they're at home yes okay so in for that group okay you know mom was used to getting dropped off um every day at, at the center and now that's not happening anymore so i would hope that they would have some way to get in touch with um whomever the the director was there or already know um, what was the routine, find out what was the routine at the day center. And I, believe me, I get it. I'm, you know, I understand that their home is not that day center and they've got all sorts of other things going on. And if they're a sandwich generation, maybe they're also trying to homeschool their children because the schools are closed. And so factoring all that in, that it's not all they have to do all day. Um, it is helpful, though, as much as you can, to find out what was the routine at the adult daycare center. 
and try and follow that. What were some of the favorite activities that that they did? Did they do beanbag toss there? Um, you know, every Tuesday at three o'clock. Have mom or dad stay on the same at home schedule that they had before the day center closed. If it required them getting up every morning and their focal point was that when they had their first cup of tea or juice in the morning, um, the Today Show was just coming on or Father Knows Best was just coming on, stick with that routine. And, if, you know, if they had, they got up, they had a cup of tea or juice, whatever, and watched, you know, me TV or something with some old reruns or maybe, you know, they still liked watching the news, whatever they did before, do that pre-out-the-door routine the same as you always did. And that really shouldn't be, shouldn't be famous last words, but I was going to say that shouldn't be too much of a new drain because you're already doing that. You're already getting them up every day and blah, blah, blah. And same routine to the point of where they would have walked out the door. If it's possible, maybe get in the car, go for a ride around the block, go for a ride around the neighborhood, like instead of dropping them off there. And again, depending on their level of cognition, Drive past the place and say, oh, you know what? Looks like they're paving the parking lot today. Um, we're not going to be able to do anything, but you know what? Let's go see if we can find some things that, you know, same activities. It's it key it to, to their ability and, and what you're comfortable with. But then at home, try and stick with those same activities. Um, there's usually a nap time in there or a little siesta time. I mean, if they don't have beds at the facility, you know, some sort of a quiet time. So I would say try and find out if you don't already know what the routine was at the day center. Um, did they have a friend at the day center? Maybe they, you know, we can get in touch with um, the bad gentleman's daughter. You know, if, if uh, Bob and Mike were friends at the day center, well, how about if Bob's son gets in touch with Mike's son and set them up with a Skype call? They can see each other's faces. Talk to that administrator, maybe do a group Skype call so that they, you know, there, there's, again, you want something tangible there that, that is recognizable to them. So yeah, that's a really the best, good idea. The best you can. And, and the other thing that I cannot applaud enough, that I can't stress enough, is intergenerational connections. This is for a family, and I'm sure the one in the middle of the sandwich is thinking, boy, lady, you don't take care of elderly people or, and young kids at the same time. Um, actually been there, done that. But, um, you know, I can't stress enough. If you've got kids that are home now being homeschooled and you've got mom or dad now not going to the adult day center, let them learn from each other. And one of the things that I would say is when you want to encourage someone with dementia to engage, rather than say it's time to do this, you know, come on, it's time for your shower. It's time to put the dishes away. Nobody likes to be told what to do. I mean, these are functioning adults. Um, it's better to say, would you help me with this, rather than can you help me? Because if you think about it, can you is kind of a little bit of a challenge there. Can you do this? Well, I don't know. Maybe I can. Maybe I can't. Maybe I better not try in case I can't. But if you say, would you help me with this? Would you is a choice. Would you help me with this? I could really use a hand with this. Would you help me with this? They're much more inclined to, then they feel useful. And again, it's not to fool anybody, but you know, you want that sense of dignity intact for as long as possible. So there again, it, it's each family is an individual mix, but don't be afraid to step out of the picture. You know, put grandma or grandpa with the younger kids and maybe the younger kids can read to grandma or grandpa or, again, 
they don't forget how to read. They may not, God bless them, remember what they read five minutes from now, but they can read. It's a reflex memory, especially if you have like large print storybooks, things like that. Um, let, let them be the, the person in charge for a while. They deserve it, you know. They fought our wars, they baked our birthday cake, so give them five minutes to be the boss. And, you know, you go, go have your own little cup of tea and call a friend. And, and just don't, don't worry so much. Make sure you've got your safety protocols in place. I'm not saying leave them. If, they're wander, if they are a wandering type, certainly you're not going to leave them in the backyard with the gate open and say, okay, you play with the kids. I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> you know, I think we're all, we're all a little better at our judgment skills than that. But within the parameters of safety and their level and their ability, let, let it go a little bit, you know, just don't, let it, just step back, see what happens. If it's a failed experiment, then you know for next time. And just don't let it carry on. If it ends up like, whoa, this is not working, pull the plug, redirect, but you never know, something really good might come of it. That is very true. And I like that distinction about would you help me instead of can you, which, man, I wish somebody had made that distinction earlier for me. My mom always wanted to be a help. She, uh, you know, she didn't want to be a burden, which was great, except that she, mm -hmm. you know, she, you could give her an A-B choice and she would say, well, I'll have whatever you're having. And you'd be like, okay, well, I'm going to have tea. Can you, do you want tea or Diet Coke? And she'd go off on this tangent of, you know, don't mind me and I'm fine and blah, blah, blah. And it was all this, very hostessy, helpful language. And I was mm -hmm. always trying to find ways to allow her to help. But I think I use the word can a lot. So, see. Well, it's not a bad word. <laughs> no, but I think would would be better. So that's a very good distinction. It's, it's not a dirty word. Um, but there again, too, let's all keep in mind that, you know, things don't have to be perfect. These times that we're living in, would you put that effort of perfection towards wiping down that countertop and making sure everybody washes their hands. If you want to be neurotic about something, um, that, that would be a good place to start. Just, you know, infection control and, and prevention. The other side of that is you don't need to be neurotic. If they unload the dishwasher and they put the soup bowls where you usually put the flat plates, hey, they had a period in their day when they were useful, when they did a meaningful chore, they felt that they were helping you, not a burden. They can fold laundry. It's not that we're putting, you know, putting this poor, sweet old lady to work. A lot of times in the care homes, you know, people will come in and they'll see all these lovely little ladies sitting at a table folding napkins or paring socks out of the laundry. And, you know, you get a few reactions of, oh, my God, for what they pay to live here, you, you put them to work. It, their generation... And, and, you know, sometimes I say there's stereotypes sometimes because the, of what was normal for a generation. Their generation was they sat with the little TV in the kitchen and watched the days of our lives and, and folded their tablecloths and napkins and paired their socks. And, and it, it's a very useful thing for them to do. So it's not like, well, you're not going to daycare, so you're going to earn your keep. That's not what it's all about. Um, they, they want to help. And you'd be surprised sometimes. I, I think we're finally coming around as a society to understanding that we don't need to make every single decision just for a person just because they have dementia. They're capable of deciding things. They know what they want and what they don't want. Um, we need to remember that the word no is a choice, not a behavior. So they say no. Mom, um, would you like to, uh, should we get your shower done now? No. Rather than go into the whole diatribe about 
how much we need to do this shower right now and you never want to blah, blah, blah. Just, okay, when would you like to do it? When would be a good time? And that's not pie in the sky because I realize that when that time comes, they're probably going to say no again. So just keep trying. Get the water nice and steamy and the room nice and inviting and nice scents going on. And again, would you help me? I need to get this shower done. I need to practice doing a shower so that, you know, um, I don't slip and fall in the tub. Can I? Would you help me? Do it, you know, do what you have to do to make it their decision. And well, swallow funny, a lot of pride along the way. <laughs> that's true. While you were talking, and it's probably because my poor dogs have not been to the groomers for 12 weeks or more. Um, my mom loved dogs and had dogs all her life. So I probably could have gotten her in the shower under the pretext of bathing the dog. At least mine. I have golden retrievers. She had miniature poodles, so you didn't need to take them in the shower. But I, And I don't remember if it was at my support group or another guest, but they had huge struggles with getting mom to to shower and everything so they would go in mom's room in the morning lay out everything for the shower get the water going and then they would get her up and so while she was using the toilet you know the water's running so it was all this familiar routine mm -hmm. and mom would just mm -hmm. do it willingly so there's a there's a suggestion too so you don't want to be the dogs you know, all the time <laughs> you know another suggestion too and it, it's it's at first blush, it sounds a little out there, but if you think about it, um, and I know a lot of people are going to say, do you know what I paid for that marble in my shower? Um, but one suggestion is if you think about it, what for either a care community or a home shower, you're pretty much looking at a very bland wall, a very bland background. How about if you get a nice, peaceful mural painted somewhere in, on that bathroom shower wall, depending on how long your loved one is going to live with you, a lot of times when families make that decision to have a loved one stay at home with them, they may have their own bathroom, consider doing something with a mural on that wall in the shower that's inviting. Um, again, were they gardeners? Paint a little flower scene. You could probably get somebody from a high school or a college um, that needs some community credits to come out and do it and just do some sort of a nice picture, something nice and inviting so that they don't feel like they're going into a box um, to be pelted with water. <laughs> and something fun. Or get some soap, you know, again, depending on their level of dementia. Some people in early stages, it would be insulting to say, Get some soap crayons. You can, again, order them online. You can probably get them at the toy store. They're crayons made out of soap, and they wash right off the tile. Play tic-tac-toe while they're in the shower. Little, you know, word games, design games. Do something other than just this is a chore. Make it something that they want to do. Actually, I like that it. idea, and I'm th realizing... Where mom lived, you know, they had the walk-in shower. Mm -hmm. And it was all white. I think the shower curtain yep. was white. There was two. Um, but yeah, and it wasn't at all like what she grew up with or what we had in the home that she'd lived in for almost 47 years. So this, it's like all of these things, it's like I've talked to over 100 people and I'm still learning new things, which I have to share because I, I can't put them into practice with my own mom anymore. But it it makes me feel good to you know i feel like we're we're coming we're learning a lot more on how to help these people in the last years of their life and make it better mm -hmm. which was my whole goal mm -hmm. for my mom is, you know how can i make this as pleasant and you know quality as i could with her failing brain and it's interesting because you kept saying that they don't forget how to read. My mom didn't forget how to read, but her brain forgot how to process a lot of stuff. I've, I've well, said and it, that, that's part of it. Yeah, her visual processing was just completely shot. And then mm -hmm. I didn't 
right uh, about six weeks before she died, I think she started having hallucina hallucinations also. Ugh. Not the easiest word to say. And it's, it's not when you're in with what I'm realizing now, when you're in with them and dealing with everything day to day, it's really hard to see, the, you know, for lack of a better term, the forest for the trees. You're like focused on the tree and it's really Absolutely. hard to see to see what's going on. Like my husband recognized that she was closer to the end before she broke her leg than I did. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, you know, it's very interesting because now I have obviously hindsight is so much better. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, if I'd known this or tried that or I had well, an idea you know, with, with little kids before I forget. Mm -hmm. if they're, even if they're in, um, if they're in a care residence and you're comfortable doing a window visit, even if you bring some of the neighbor kids just for fun, have the kids be silly and do funny stuff outside the window. My mom loved to watch kids. She would have loved to watch kids do weird things outside her window. You do that, have them sing little uh, songs they learned in school because they're not singing them in school these days. So yeah, they'd probably have you know a good time singing some songs for them. Um, doing some pictures for them. There again, that, that inter, intermingling of the generations um, used to not be uh, an odd situation back a generation or two ago. Um, everybody kind of just lived with everybody. <laughs> and you had that, that richness of the culture that was passed down. You know, and again, it, it's every individual's journey. So depending on where they're at, um, there are people in memory care communities that, you know, have other challenges who still have their memory intact, still recognize everybody. Sometimes they don't forget, quote unquote. They never really forget their children. It's just they can't place them on their timeline and their reality. They don't forget their children. They just don't recognize them all grown up necessarily. I'm laughing because my mom right before Thanksgiving said, I was asking her what she wanted to do. Do you want to spend Thanksgiving with your, with your daughters? And she told me she didn't have daughters. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> she was remembering her brothers. So I'm thinking at the time where she was mm -hmm. at in her timeline, as you said, I think she, was, she didn't have daughters because she wasn't that old. Those are right. really interesting. Exactly, exactly. That's <clears throat> that is a very, very good point. And you know, getting back to um, folks that now have their loved one with dementia at home because the the day centers are closed. Um, keep please uh, keep in mind. I I can't tell anybody what to do or how to do it. I can only recommend um, and suggest. But I would ask that you all please keep in mind that if it, it's the disease, it's not the person. Um, I do have a blog on my website. Um, it's newdawndementia.com slash blog. And I do have a, a little blog post on there about it's the disease, not the person. So when they possibly are asking you that same question every five minutes, Please don't be frustrated. They're not doing it to drive you crazy. It's the disease. And some of with repetitive questions, they may genuinely be information seeking. What time is dinner? And you say 6 o'clock. But they can't internalize that answer. They, they don't have a, a storage compartment for when you say 6 o'clock. So they're forgetting that they asked the question or they're forgetting that you answered them at 6 o'clock. So one of the things you can do is either write down dinner 6 p.m. on an index card or you can make um, just a little, you know, construction paper or poster board, something stiff that they can hold on to. Picture of a clock with the hands at 6 o'clock and maybe cut something out of one of the Sunday food circulars um, and, and paste that on there with there so that they can look at that and they have a reference point of, ah, 
food, mm, this looks good. Oh, the clock says six o'clock. Because even if they can't say it's 6 p.m. by this clock, it, it, it's, it's deeper than that, okay? They, they know what time it is. They just maybe can't express it in our terms. And so if they can't internalize the answer, externalize it for them. Give them something written down or a picture. Um, that might help with the questions a little bit if they're truly information seeking. If they say to you, um, you know, where's, they're asking for their husband who passed away years ago, you know, where's Jack? Rather than get into Jack died, dad died 40 years ago and keep taking them to the cemetery and it doesn't work. Rather than that, just say, oh, gee, where do you think he is, mom? Or where do you think she might be, dad? And whatever answer they give you, roll with it. So that five minutes later, when mom says, where's dad? You go back and you say, oh, I think you just told me he's still at work. Or I think you didn't, you just mentioned he went fishing. I think that sounds about right. And after a while, they're comfortable with that answer. So they may actually move on to another question. So they may be information seeking. If they're not information seeking, they might be seeking reassurance. So with that, there again, something nice and cuddly to hold on to. Um, let them sit in the kitchen, let them help a little bit so that they're reassured that they have some sort of a, an anchor point. Um, and the other thing they, if they ask a repeat question could be they're just attention seeking. They just feel kind of left out. So there again, that intergenerational thing, you know, and it's kind of the same. It's a reverse thing with your kids. Don't, don't ask a 12-year-old, do you want to read the newspaper or do you want to read a story to grandpa? Because no matter what you say at that age, you're going to go, oh, mom, I raise kids. <laughs> you know, I, I get it. But they want their grandparents. But it's like, you really, you're asking me to do something here? But again, empower the kids. Would you help me? It would really help grandma to feel better. Would you help the family? Could you spend 10 minutes with grandpa? Play catch, whatever. Play beanbag toss. Empower those kids to do some of those activities with them as well. They're not going out for school recess. So you have, you have kind of the perfect marriage there. You have the older person that's not doing the activities at the day center, and you have the younger kids who aren't going out for recess and don't have much else to do. So put the two together and let them have fun. That sounds like an excellent place to stop. This was so wonderful. I really appreciate it. I learned new things, so I'm sure the listeners have too. Well, you know what? We're all feeling our way as we go. Um, there's, there is no bona fide solution right now and, and to really kind of uh, put the mixer up to high speed um, in this great cake we're baking together. Everyone with dementia is different. So we, it, it's for us to kind of co coalesce as, as you say and thank you for doing this podcast because it, you know, it, it gets some information out there. Um, I don't profess that the things I suggest are true or tried and true or work, but they're a real good place to start and just kind of always keep it positive, please. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.